Hey everyone, it's VHS Massacre Radio. I'm your host, Tom Seymour. And hey everybody, it's Ken Powell. Ken Powell, back, back in the house. Back in the saddle, as they say. As, uh, you know, a bit a bit of a hiatus, one would say. Uh, if you call it two years a hiatus, yeah, that's, <laughs> that's quite a bit. Yeah, I think it's almost been like two complete years since yeah. uh, last I did a show with you guys. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Um, Dave... Dave Lute moved out of uh, Astoria, so we don't we don't have him gracing our presence anymore. Yeah, he's like, "Fuck you guys, podcasting <laughs> and all that noise." Done with you, dickholes. And uh, Professor James Richardson is in um, Oslo. He's like, "Fuck America, you're <laughs> podcasting." He's like, "I'm out of here," uh, which which I can certainly understand. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess we have, got, have a few things coming up. Um, Beyond reviewing uh, the film of the week, which is... The Bronx Executioner. Right. Which I initially confused it with The Bronx Warrior whenever I told you, he's like, check out this movie. And it's because the um, box covers aren't that too far apart, and uh-huh. the movies are made around the same time. What uh, year was The Executioner made, do you know? A, well, it says that uh, I think it was released in 89, but some of the footage is actually from another movie from 83, so... Ah, yeah, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of a, of a film. That's why on the IMDb it's got all this archive footage uh, listing. I was yes. like, what is? What yeah. the hell is that? Oh well. Anyway, before we dig into the Bronx Executioner, um, so, um, well, basically, we've decided to start working on a sequel to VHS Massacre, um, tentatively titled VHS Massacres. Maskers, yeah, 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 with the Z. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, maybe, maybe with a Z. The the nineties kids, they dig the Z's, right? Like extremes. Yeah, with the yep. Z. Because yeah. Uh, so, um, but I, I was thinking about it, and um, I think what you know, I entered the tellies, and we won three different telly awards, including a silver, which the silver is actually um, pretty hard to get. And um, we got that one for best. Um, it was something. There was a category because tellies traditionally are more for television. So we won in the non-broadcast category um, because of essentially because of Amazon Prime. Because uh, I emailed them, I was like, "Does this is count?" And they're like, "Yeah, that's great. It's non-broadcast." Um, and there was a category called. Um, it was under seven hundred dollars per minute. <laughs> Okay, it's, it's very specific. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and uh, and that, that's the, that's the low budget. That's what they call it. Uh, yeah, under seven hundred dollars per minute, and ours was uh, ironically seven hundred dollars for seventy two minutes. So, <laughs> yes. got everybody beat. Yeah, so um, we won, and then we won in the documentary and the the main documentary category and the main um, entertainment category, which is is pretty insane. Nice. It's like the the movie's been out for a, a little over two years now, and still getting it, some accolades and re- nice reviews. Yeah, I mean, it's still people still talk about it. And Steph was on Instagram, and I I don't know why I never thought to to look up hashtag VHS Massacre, but it pops up a lot. Oh wow! There's probably a couple dozen photos of like the movie and people watching it and saying things about it, and then Twitter. People still post about it. Um, There's a couple of guys that did like a VHS massacre hunt based off of the movie, right? Yeah, yeah. Like maybe last year. Yep. They saw it at this Gallery 5, and then they decided to do their own. Um, yeah, I mean, so it, it's definitely... I thought it had some um, some legs, as they say. I thought it had some traction. So Sexy legs. Some sexy legs. So, um, and really, I just still felt like doing that kind of thing but we we had uh talked uh yesterday right it was yeah, yesterday. yeah yeah just yesterday uh, um and you had felt similar about it or, or what were you thinking yeah um just i guess kind of brief people up like i had gotten a new job and um by the time like the i finished up with the podcast a couple of years ago like i was kind of burnt out on a, on a lot of things especially movie things just because of the the from the podcast, doing the movie, the um, going to school, all that. It was just like movie, 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 filmmaking, filmmaking, filmmaking. 
And so, like, it was great to have, like, that nice little break. And then about a year ago, I started working out on fleshing out an idea for a documentary about baseball cards and this Mickey Mantle 1953 uh, Tops card and shot a little bit of stuff, did some research, went to a bunch of baseball card stores. But it never resonated, I think, in the same way like when making VHS Massacre did. And it was like a couple months ago, like, I, you know, I put the baseball card thing to the side and I'm like, okay, I need something. I need a creative outlet. There's nothing here, you know, like my current job doesn't have the same outlet that like when I was working at LaGuardia um, it doesn't tend to drift off into filmmaking as much so I'm like I need something creative and then uh, I went back and listened to a few of our old episodes and then it's like yeah B-movies like I haven't watched a good B-movie in a while and that's when I watched the Bronx Executioner Bronx Executioner like about three weeks ago and I'm like I, I miss this I, like, I miss watching this stuff I miss talking about this stuff and um, the VHS Massacre stuff, you know, with the the Telly Award and all that stuff, I'm like, I think there's still some stuff out there that can be mined from it. And, um, you know, I get back out there on the streets, and I don't know if we're going to, like, actually physically hunt for VHS again, or if it's just, you know, more talking to people that worked in the industry at the time, um, or currently are still working in it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, it's that's the thing is, we, you know, that we have to nail down is exactly what we're what we're trying to do with it. But we did... Um, Debbie Rashawn is on board. We're going to interview her on the 29th. So we're going to have to put our thinking caps on about what to do. Uh, one angle I thought about was um, just um, almost in in defense of exploitation. So something like trauma, is you'd call that exploitation, or some of the more uh, B-movie horror um, films... Um, even the Bronx Executioner, you know, it's got it's got action, it's got some nudity, it's got violence. Um, they're exploiting that sort of like future motorcycle thing, you know. Yeah. Yes. Um, and but you know, it's sort of like in today's culture, everyone's so incredibly offended by everything. Um, you know, Debbie was telling me um, just about how. How she's treated. I mean, she's been in over 300 films at this point. She's one of the most um, prolific, um, you know, independent film actors, in, you know, in American history for sure. Um, at 300 films, and people judge her left and right about doing, you know, nudity in, in some of her films. You know, well, you know, which is uh, well, going back to Debbie Rashawn herself like say over 300 films that's uh, that's got to be up there with one of the most prolific actors or actresses period in like period. the history of cinema yeah and um and and they're each you know all in varying degrees of success and quality and budgets and stuff but that that is still pretty amazing and she's still out there making movies mm -hmm. and hopefully she does another 300 before it's all said and done um yeah but it, it's interesting to see like the world that we're in now you know which there's a, a lot of a rapid change and yeah. I don't know if, like, if film is keeping up or are we going to set the standard or what, where does exploitation still have a home and is that a home going to have to change right. in the current climate y yeah I mean and, and like not to delve too far into it but you know it's like Luke Cage clearly inspired the music is clearly inspired by 70's exploitation um, their series itself, in a way, and ex black exploitation specifically had some pretty incredible things. I mean, you had Pam Greer was a, a black action hero yeah. in the seventies, right? Um, possibly late sixties. I have to look, but definitely in the seventies. Um, you know, these are things that were not happening in the mainstream, and no. eventually they did work their way in the mainstream. Same thing with John Waters. Had a, John Waters, even even like Kaufman, had trans people in his film, their films, and those films were crass and they're crude. But you know, I would argue that a lot of the fringe cinema were trying to do something edgy and on the outside that mainstream wouldn't touch. But because of the fact they existed, you brought um, eventually you brought a lot of marginalized people into the mainstream. Oh, absolutely. You bring sort of an acceptance. It's like, um, 
I forget there was somebody I heard talking about it but like the like people I, I don't want to speak for like a certain group of people but like uh, in the 80s the, the gay thing was sort of um, the way that it was portrayed was like this over the top yep. flamboyant thing and they said that and a lot of them will say that was necessary in order for it to be accepted because it's kind of like in your face this is it this is it and you keep hammering it home like this is it this is it and people eventually kind of start accepting it and, and now not everybody's like that we know that um, but it's a way of like you know it, it's kind of exploitating in a way of like, yeah. like this is gay but at a, a, a different extreme now, this like, is like a stereotypical uh, you know stereotypical gay character but we're gonna we're gonna push it into the culture until people get a three dimensional perspective on it, and then eventually that that can that stereotype can fall away. But without bringing that in the fringe, maybe it doesn't happen that way. You know, I, I don't think so because it kind of keeps it, it uh, keeps everybody still comfortable if you. If you keep, like, you know, if the characters don't have that dimension of, like, you know, is he gay or straight or whatever, and maybe for the most part you don't care, but um, by having this character like this, it's in your face, you kind of have to deal with it. Right. And after a while, hopefully people will deal with it in a correct way, so that now you can maybe move the goalpost a little bit with that type of character, and you don't have to have, like, this very... Could be borderline offensive, like you, yeah. and, and, and maybe and then it was, so, yeah, yeah. <laughs> for sure. You the know. guys like I think uh, Lloyd Kaufman or John Waters, they weren't being offensive in the way that they were trying to. I mean, they were exploiting a little bit of that culture, but as a way to for the, that culture to gain acceptance. Um, I ultimately, yeah, yeah, ultimately, and and honestly, even if let's say the motivation of the director wasn't like purely benevolent uh, you got to look at the and I'm not saying the ends, ends justify the means but what I'm saying is that ultimately it, I actually think exploitation as a whole was a net positive gain I think I guess that's what I would argue not that everything was cool there was some <laughs> shit that was not cool but we're going to the Bronx executioner there's a, a rape scene that it, it Tame by what is shown, but when you're watching, it can definitely make you feel uncomfortable. And like you start thinking, like of the actress, and like like you don't know how they're, they're, they're um, emotionally how everything is washing over them. So yeah, there, there's some things like that that probably weren't that wasn't kosher. But um, I think we it helped us get to a certain place. But it's. Um, it's interesting to see like how exploitation fits into today's society and, yeah. and how are filmmakers using it. Well, can you do it? Can you get away with it? Like, and here's the thing: like, if it's labeled the the right way, um, like, do people just don't touch it? Like, there's some really offensive titles now. There's one called "Run, Bitch, Run," and you're like, wow, that's really fucked up. But then you say to yourself, okay, that title says do not watch this movie if you're going to be offended, you know? Yeah. And uh, I, I think it's, I think that's too much. I think that's too overboard, um, personally. But um, but I, I do think, like, there are certain titles that uh, that you, you know what you're getting into and, it, and they're very easy to avoid. And I think that's another thing, too. Like, it used to be enough to say, if you don't want to watch it, don't pay for it. Yeah. And that was that was enough. If you don't want to watch it, don't watch it. If it's offensive to you, don't watch it. That doesn't seem to fly anymore. It seems like, no, um, I, I watched it, I'm offended, you should pull that down, is sort of a thing, you know what I mean? Yeah, I mean that's kind of it, it can be very dangerous. I mean it is, it's in a way a good thing that we have more ability, I think, to have a say in what is put out there. But I think to the point of where you can have certain groups control basically everything that we watch is very dangerous. 
yeah. even if it's like the best intentions, like mm-hmm. it can absolutely be very dangerous. And I don't, me personally, this is my personal family, I don't want to live in that world. I like being able to have access to many different things and then me having the personal responsibility to be like, okay, I don't like it. Um, I'm not, I'm not going to watch this or the people that worked in this. I don't care for, but I'm, I don't want to sit out and like destroy careers or lives or it not to be out there. Cause for somebody else, it may be more cathartic. It might be uh, um, a different experience for them. It might reach them in a way that it didn't reach me. I, well, you, well, on that point, what I don't like is the idea that a filmmaker is guilty of all the actions of the characters within the film. And that we're, we're going into this area of stupidity at this point where it's like, you know, it's like... Um, uh, Darren, Ar- Darren Aronofsky did uh, Mother. So, did you end up seeing Mother? I haven't seen Mother. Okay, so the complaint about that is that um, Jennifer Lawrence doesn't. She's the main character, but doesn't have. She doesn't seem like she has a ton of agency. Um, but what it is, it is one of the maybe the best representations I've ever seen, in my opinion, of what a nightmare is actually like. What one. How time shifts, how people change, how spaces change. I think it's one of the most accurate portrayals of a nightmare. And that being said, in a nightmare, shitty things happen to you. And so the complaints were like, ah, this is a bit misogynist. She had no agency. Um, the you know Javier Bardem's character was this like, uh, you know. Uh, whatever antagonistic you know character and um my whole thing on that is like i don't want to say so what but the point is like how are you going to make a pleasant you're going to make a nightmare that's pleasant like i don't th- see that's what's starting to split my brain you know i'm like no it's hor- it's a horrible it's a horror movie yeah you know so um well, I, mean, I feel like really good movies more or less hold up a mirror to yourself and it's kind of like what do you see you usually take from it uh, I think it's like uh, like an artist that you know makes a painting um, he can be interpreted a thousand different ways uh, what the artist may have attended or maybe the artist didn't really intend anything and it's more like what, what do you feel what does it make you feel and so for those people that are seeing it the way like maybe they need to I don't want to say they need to examine their lives but maybe they do maybe they need to have some things that they have to work out as well um, and they didn't like what they saw when it reflected back in this world but yeah it's uh, we have these discussions I think with numerous in New York City where we talked about like the, the director and you know it's it's his vision, his story. Um, like, I don't want it to silence any filmmaker, unless they're out there making, like, propaganda, which is a totally different thing, um, you know, like, with the, the Nazis and all of that stuff. But yep. outside of that, like, I don't I don't want to keep any filmmakers silent, no matter what the story is. Um, will some of it tend to be misogynistic in a way? Maybe. I mean, um, but I think sometimes we need to see that, too, because it kind of, like, and not to say that Mother is being misogynistic, but there's other films that are clearly being misogynistic. Well, but it allows us to like say, like, that's not what we want to be. It, Let's it, try to be better. Also, I would say, I would argue it's not misogynistic. Because to me, misogyny would be a celebration of it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so with context, it's um, it's not a celebration of it. It's It's a nightmare. It's bad. It's bad for everyone. It's bad for the, you know, it's a... So for me, the point is, um, you know, is there such thing as misogynistic films? Yes, of course. But when people confuse the the setup with the punchline, um, like I always think of Fight Club. Fight Club is about how nihilism doesn't work, how this like how being a misogynistic f- boy frat boy club isn't good and doesn't work ultimately and the guy was essentially schizophrenic which is why he was doing all that stupid shit so the the point of the film is how it's bad it's not how it's awesome yeah so maybe the viewer didn't get that you know so i don't i just that's 
I think part of my beef with the modern interpretation, people are just triggered and they're not really thinking through the meaning or moral. They're just like, no, fuck you. I'm tired of this. Well, I don't know if I talked about this with Oswald. Or I think it was Oswald, you know, um, your coworker, yep. about how as movie audiences, I feel like we're probably more savvy than we've ever been, but I think at times we might also be dumber in a way too yeah that like we have um a very extensive you know film dialogue now we have like a vocabulary that's it's deeper than it's ever been but yet i feel like there's a lot of people that watch movies at a very surface level and if you watch fight club at a very surface level i could see yeah maybe you think like uh, uh doing the things that they did is seen as a, a cool um frat boy thing to do and but there, it is there's you have to dig deep deeper down into it like if you I mean even with the book and the movie you can see like there's something more than there uh, than just uh, what's at the surface level and I, I don't think a lot of the American audiences and not to hammer home on the American audiences mm-hmm. but uh, they don't do that they don't they don't watch the films be like you know like it's Fight Club is not Fast and the Furious Fast and Furious I would say yeah probably not anything really to dig deep down right, into right uh, Fight Club though is more layered uh, than than that yeah, no, I, I agree. And so I think, I just think what what has happened online is just like, it, you know, uh, I've been saying this for a while, you know, online is not particularly a reasonable space. People don't tend to, um, you know, write things um, at two in the morning that say like, oh, that was very pleasant, <laughs> you know, or, or hey, this was, this was not bad. Um, you usually get like, pretty intensified, pretty polarizing things. And it's like what people said about like town hall meetings. It's like um, the, I think John Stewart said the extremes like control the dialogue because moderates have moderate people have shit to do. And so like they have jobs and shit, you know, so, but it's like online, it's just like, you're, you know, it's like when we put out VHS massacre, I was amazed how much positive press we got in this day and age, in 2018, yeah. to do a $700 feature and to yeah. not have people shit on it. Yeah. Like, it was incredible to me, you know? Yeah. No, and this is my, my first film, and, um, and I, yeah, generally the uh, response event has been very positive, and um, there still are a couple of people that will take their shit on anything yeah, that comes yeah. along uh, which you know you, you can sort of read between the lines of some people's responses and be like yeah that guy was just a failed filmmaker or he's pissed that he probably didn't think of the idea first um there's some jealousy out there but yeah with uh, social media and stuff like that yeah it's like I remember in the early days of text messaging like there's always there was always a confusion of like Never knowing the tone that somebody was responding to you and, and yep. then like being like having to figure that out. Like, is this person being passive aggressive? Are they pissed at me? And then I think as I became, at least me personally, as I became more educated, I always be like, okay, this is not, this person not responding how I think they are. Cause I think for all intentions, we're good people. And, um, you sort of learn how to read between the lines with social media I still feel like that's in the we're still kind of in the infancy of it. Like I still oh, yeah. don't feel like we know how to correctly use it and how to how it's best used. No, I think you know with the death of things like the video store era and the brick and mortar, like what what you also had a death of is like reasonable conversation. Yeah, because you could go in and like let's say you were the video store clerk or you were talking to a you know someone else in the video store, you'd have a good conversation. There was like a face to face dialogue, you know. And now people are like spouting this horrible shit into a vacuum, essentially. And it's not, you know, people in person are way more reasonable than they are, and they're way less cynical. And they're way nicer to each other. More empathetic. Yeah. Maybe you have a human face. Yeah. And, and what happen, what's happening is, like, as all that 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 way of viewing films has, has been going downhill. I mean, we still have the theaters. Um, you, I, it becomes, I think, much more difficult for an independent filmmaker to survive 
and the, the toxic toxicity of the of online because that's now that's pretty much everything online is pretty much it unless you're playing in film festivals yeah I mean there's definitely this race to be the first with everything and social media is be the first one to run down a movie or the first one to like you know to try to get it taken down to um, and then there's sometimes there's the other extreme of like you know trying to be very positive about it too but I think it tends to more delve into the cesspool of being negative um, because I think a lot of the ma uh, mainstream media kind of they love covering more of the negative aspects too uh, I think drama well drama is always sold and so if the me if people online are you know bashing it the media will cover it it's like the um, Star Wars The Last Jedi like the the bad press it got the media absolutely like just like gravitated towards that so it was like you know um, the, the like any harassing of an actress online is stupid but the fact that like it was maybe like a few handful of guys that were doing it there was like the big covers from that um, so it was amplified it was amplified right. I would still say like it, 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 the response from that very few was not warranted. It, it, like you don't go around harassing an actress who's playing a part. Like she didn't write the part. Yeah, exactly. Um, like if you were more hammering home her performance, then I, I would say like, okay, maybe you have something there. But still, don't harass her like constantly on her Twitter and stuff like that to force her to get off. Um, yeah, it's, that's social terrible. media. Even though I would say like being off social media might be the best thing for for most people. I yeah, man. I I I'm really trying to only use it as a like sort of vehicle to uh to like promote creative projects at this point you know yeah i mean um, me personally too i've backed off of really posting anything these days um like it's best not to put your political opinions or religious opinions it's like sort of the same thing like never talk about religion and politics so, uh and, or it, basically anything like having a, a, an opinion about anything is, and i think maybe it's better like talk about your opinions with the people in your circle yeah, yeah. I mean, and um, but you know, you know. Hopefully, we don't get shit for this podcast. You never know. But I mean, at least we're speaking to what we've, what we love to do, what we've studied, what you know, you know. I I'd like to think at this point in my career, I could at least um, somewhat speak from an um, an area of you know. Expertise, I, I, quasi expertise, something. You know, you, I've been you doing have, it for like, twenty years. You have nine thumbs under your belt. Yeah, now. yeah. You know, and I had a news background, and you know, um, we're you know both college educated, and it's you know, um, went to school for film and all that. So I don't know. Um, you were also Tom from the Office, right? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah, not not the Office. The it's in the show network. Network, yes. Um, but uh, anyway, but uh, so. Um. Anyway, but why don't we talk about uh, Bronx Executioner, huh? Yeah, Bronx Executioner. Um, I, I want to do the the trilogy of these Bronx movies. Yes, because there's a the, I mentioned earlier. There's this other movie called The Bronx Warrior that has a very similar looking poster. Like it looks like you could easily get the two movies confused. Uh, and I went and watched the trailer, and I'm like, it looks very similar, actually, to the Bronx Execution as well. But they, um, they're they all, I think, made in Italy, um, just like the Bronx Execution was made in Italy. It's incredible. Okay, so Vario Amici, right? Vario yes. Amici is credit, the director. The credit is, I think, Bob Collins. It's Bob Collins. <laughs> and and, uh, and I, was, I didn't know this, directed fucking Troll 2, man. No, he was the editor. Oh, he's the editor on Troll 2? Yeah, he's the editor on Troll 2. Oh, shit. Yeah, it was another Italian guy that directed Troll 2. Because um, I, I went and looked that up, too. Because I, like, I saw it was like, Troll 2? I was like, he directed Troll 2? And then... Um, oh, he's the editor, I get you. Dino... Like, Dino Larinardis or something like that. It's the director from Troll 2. But, yeah, he worked at, uh, he worked as an editor on a lot of Italian films. But um, Troll 2, I, I did like that connection, though. I was like, uh, you know, one of the worst... Best, uh, best of the worst movies, whatever. Oh yeah. Um, with the uh, Bronx execution, in which I will say is probably more worse than best of anything. Yeah, yeah. Bronx Ex Executioner is a, is a very uh, specific uh, film uh, made in 1989. Uh, this, as you said earlier, in no way resembles 
remotely what the Bronx could <laughs> even ever look like topographically. Well, I think even if you were to nuke the Bronx, which hopefully never happens, it still wouldn't look like what the Bronx <laughs> no. looked like. The only thing that they have, and I totally forgot this, but um, when I told you yesterday about the movie, I said like there was no connection whatsoever to New York City. There actually is in the first couple of minutes. There's some. It looks like um, stock footage of uh, yeah. aerial shots of New York City. Really terrible stock fit footage of you know the twin towers. Um, you have uh, they're putting these like futuristic sounds. You mean eighties futuristic sounds? They're showing. Um, Waveform monitors and uh, vector scopes, and yeah. we're supposed. And there, there's this like droll narration about the future, and which uh, doesn't really reveal too much either. Of like, you know, there's no placement of the year we're really in. Yeah, it's just like it's the future. But if you going by the aerial shots and stuff in New York City, it's like none of that sells. Like it's <laughs> it's 1980s New York. It, uh, New York. Like, yeah. There's no doubt about it. I mean, I do like seeing that stuff because it's cool to see New York City and how it's changed over the years or how it really hasn't, you know, in, in a lot of ways as well. Um, but then it moves uh, quickly to this scene in the forest, which I initially thought, I was like, well, okay, I can still buy one in New York City because it's like maybe this is like Central Park or something <laughs> right. where this guy is being, you know, chased through the woods by this unseen shooter. Mm -hmm. Um but this movie, it's hallmark. I would say like a lot of really bad editing, like <laughs> yeah, a lot of cuts that like don't line up. And it, it's with this first scene where the guy it looks like he's about to be shot by somebody, but this sheriff guy, which is played by uh, Woody it's, Strode, yes, who was in um, uh, a western. He was in um, Quick uh, Quick and the Dead, Quick and the Dead, and I think um, he. Fought. Once Upon a Time in the West. Oh, okay, yep. And then he also battled Kurt Douglas in Spartacus. Well, <laughs> you know? You know, he's a very famous uh, actor, uh, recognizable. I think if you see him, you're like, oh, I, I know that guy. He also looks very much like my father-in-law, <laughs> which my wife always hates whenever I see a Woody Strode movie and I take a snapshot and send it, like, here's your dad. <laughs> and he was a cop as well, which was kind of fitting. Oh, that's cool. Um, it also stars... Uh, Gabriel Gorey as James, um, Margie the main lead, right? The, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, he's the he's the sort of generic John Connor, right? Is that yeah, it? yeah? Okay, that's how I just describe this movie. If, if Blade Runner and I think Terminator kind of like had some kind of weird baby thing. Yeah, I think I got a distinct T two vibe, but you're right. It's like post apocalyptic, so maybe yeah. like a maybe like a a really shitty Mad Max meets T2. With some Blade Runner with, some with the <laughs> humanoids and the androids. Yes, for sure. Yeah, good yeah. point. It's a little mishmash of everything. I think it was like this Italian director who saw like all three of these movies around the same time. Because those, those three movies came out within a few years of each other. And he's like, what's the best way I can rip off all of these movies? Yeah, and they really did try. Uh, the, the There's this sort of main thug character um i don't know if it's uh rod robinson but he's sort of jacked like arnold Sch schwarzenegger oh you're talking about dakar dakar oh yeah dakar okay dakar is played by alex vitale yeah he's well, he's actually like the good good bulky the good guy yeah a yeah, good guy who if you his, his dialogue is almost like laughable like I, i'm pretty sure it's dubbed yeah, it's dubbed. It just at times it feel he clearly this guy wants to be Arnold oh. Schwarzenegger, and then whoever dubbed his voice, every now and then he's putting this like really mild sort of accent on, yeah. and you get the feeling they're just like they they just wish it was Arnold. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, and he's saying really he's supposed to be a, a cyborg. And there's, I don't know how to say this any other way, but he just sounds really dumb. And yeah. and a lot of the quote quote cyborgs have these really thick accents. And they're like, I'm a cyborg, <laughs> you know. And, and uh, it just sometimes, um, I think, you know, Arnold kind of, uh, he, he bended the sort of rules of acceptability of a, a robot's voice. You know, because you're like, I'm a robot, I'm a cyborg, you know, and you're like, for some reason you buy it. 
Yeah. Um, and maybe they thought that was just like free, you know, you know, it's a free for all. Like we can have any accent, and that's a you know, a robot can sound like that. Yeah, especially a Bronx robot. Like, a bro- <laughs> I think I'd been better off going with a stereotypical Bronx. Yeah, accent, you know. but even if you you know, even if like you had a robot that sounded like Bernie Sanders, you'd be like, ah, <laughs> what? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think you. I mean, not to say like that that accent's uneducated, but you feel like. Um, it's, it's very specific, I guess. Yeah, that's yeah, the yeah. Thing. I mean, it's for something manufactured, like it's very specific, you know. Yeah, I and mean, maybe if the robots, I guess, were trying to fit in with the humans of the Bronx, even though there's there's like no other humans except for I think the James character and the sheriff. I think. Yeah, sheriff and James. That's it. And in the in the in the beginning of the film, uh, James. The sort of wannabe sheriff. He meets. Um, uh, he he meets the the main character. He meets a uh, uh, Woody Strode, and he's like, "I'm known simply as the Black Man." Yeah, I, I wrote that note down too. It's a very, it's, it's a very like um, I don't know. It, it makes you feel a little uncomfortable hearing it, and like it's like was he okay saying this line, or did he even actually say that line? Because everybody's dubbed. Yeah, everyone's dubbed. Yeah. Everybody's dubbed. So. Who knows exactly what the original, you know, phrasing was, but it just seems a little off. Also, it's like, you know, it just it, like a, I imagine being the character, it's like uh, talking to um, Strode, you know, and you'd be like, oh, he's like, I'm known as the black man. It's like. Well, can I just call you by your name? <laughs> yeah, yeah it'd be better. Uh, I think his, his character's name is Warren, which actually most of the time everybody else does refer to him as Warren. Yeah. Except for I think one of the bad guy androids at one time calls him the Black Man, but outside of that, everybody calls him Warren. They never call him the Black Man. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's weird. And, but I'm also like, it's the Bronx and post '80s or whatever. This is. I think there would be more than just like one, just one black, black person. Man, so yeah. Well, yeah, one black man. So <laughs> yeah. it'd be kind of confusing when you say the Black Man. And it's like it's hey, which, okay. Yeah. Um, it's like. Would be better they say, call you that, or you want to be called that? <laughs> yeah, what, yeah. Which is it? Because I can call you whatever. Yeah. Uh, the whole thing was just kind of, yeah, it's just that, like, cringe-worthy, like, I don't know. There is moments of, of I, I wouldn't say like a great movie, but a, a, a better movie, where there's this other, um, it's very confusing to me. I think the androids are the bad guys, and they're like the main bad guys, and the humanoids, which is like the Arnold yep. wannabe. Yep. And so in the android camp, there's this character named the sh- uh, Shark, and he's kind of like in love with this lady who's kind of in charge of everything. That's uh, Margie Newton. Margie Newton, Who yes. plays Margie. Yeah. Yes. And, and there's glimpses of like his character like wanting, I guess, love or something mm-hmm. more. But it's never really fully explored. But I think the better movie would have been focusing on that aspect. But with this movie, you have it's hard to connect with anything because there's so many like little threads that are out there. Yeah, you're right. It, it is sort of like a, a mishmash. I, you know, I was thinking that character you're talking about sort of had this. You can tell it was supposed to be like one of these cool scars that yeah. someone has under their eye, but it kind of looked like grape jelly or <laughs> you know, strawberry yeah, jelly on his it's face. It's supposed to be like one of those things where like the stitching, like it's like future stitching or whatever yeah and then in one scene it was just brown and yeah. it's like uh. but I, I know what you mean there are shots there's one shot it's this empty hangar and it's beautiful shots like you know fire barrels the shot dolly's back it exposes about like eight different motorcycles the music's really interesting and there are these like yeah these glimmers of of, of something that's way more solid work yeah and it just ends up being uneven, and and so there was. Is that because of archive footage or something? What? Well, one of the things is that the, a lot of footage is pulled from another movie uh, called The Final Executioner, which I believe was made in '83. Like some the scenes with uh, Woody Strode's character and James, mm-hmm. that's from another movie. Oh wow, yeah. that's weird. Yeah, it's very weird. Which you know, I have to go and watch the final executioner just to see like if that's actually the better movie. I'm I'm suspecting probably is because it probably makes more sense. But the James character, he is in both movies, and so I guess they. Wow. They okay, them. that's why it's so weird. I think because the setup is essentially that um, that there's these 
there's a sheriff and a wannabe sheriff, and it's post-apocalyptic. There's this Bronx territory. There were these very flawed cyborgs and humanoids made, and um, they were going to just uh, destroy them all, but because of public outrage, they um, they were forced to keep them alive. So they made the Bronx a sort of reservation for cyborgs and humanoids, and they they are banished there, but... There are these sheriffs there to sort of... In, this is the confusing part. Like, they're sort of overseeing... It doesn't make... They're like, oh, we're just trying to keep them from killing each other. It's like, it's not really what they ever do. They sort of hang around, occasionally fight some of them. Yeah, I mean, they're not very good at keeping them from killing each other. Because, like, in the That's first 20 all the- minutes, like, they, they basically the, the androids wipe out a, a, a whole lot of the humanoids. I I I want to say this though. I totally respect the 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 filmmakers um because you know you're looking at it. I mean there's like, you know, 20 or 30 different motorcycles. They're shooting um all these different interesting locations. They have all these you know extras with all these outfits. It's like it's a it's a ton of effort that yeah. like you might not even see that in a in a Hollywood film. Like they're so lazy now, they would just do everything against green screen. You know, these people were out there. Clearly, it took them a long time to do this stuff. Yeah. Lots um, of squib shots. They actually used squibs. There wasn't people just being like. You know, sometimes there was people like, uh, but you know, they used several different squibs and explosions and like it's um, a very uh, complicated shoot at times. And like I say it's part of that like glimmers of uh, a. Better movie that sometimes I think falls more prey to, uh, like I say, maybe the using of the other extra footage, but also like the editing. I think at times is is it can be very confusing. Of like where, like one moment, like there's a, a specific fight scene between um, Descartes' character and one of the the bad. Not I don't think it was Shark. It was somebody else. And like one moment, the bad guy they were having like a stick fight. He knocks Dakar down. Like, he is clearly knocked down. <laughs> the bad guy takes off running, and the next shot is we see Dakar going through a hallway with the other guy jumping on top of him. And it's like, that... What happened there? Yeah. We don't know if he yeah, woke yeah. up or whatever. And, you know, I think in the hands of a better editor, you'd probably cut to one of the other scenes and then go back to, like, the continuation of the fight. I don't, it, it just... It, the editing um, leaves a lot to be desired. And there's, like, the reuse of... Like the car near the end is going up these stairs, and he keeps shooting two people. Like he'll, he'll come around the corner, shoot two people. And if you've seen the building from the outside, it looks like it's only maybe two floors, three floors tops. But if you were to count, it's like five or so <laughs> times he does the same thing. Four or five invisible floors. Yeah. And then when he actually does make it to the top, he goes down a hallway, and then he starts going back down. And you can tell it's the exact same stairs that he's going back down. Um, and it's little things like like. It's it's charming in a way. Like it's, it wasn't intentionally supposed to be charming. Yeah. It, it is. It's like it's like how if we were making a movie, we'd probably do the same same thing. Yeah, like and they were definitely trying to get the get the running time they wanted. And um, yeah, I, I, also you know like what I noticed too was like um, profuse uh, falling in the sand <laughs> shots. Is yes. uh, you had some uh, some nudity. Um, not that much, but you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, main female lead, Maggie Newton, you have some nudity there, which I will say, uh, respectfully, nice, nice eighties boobs. Yeah, yeah, it was pretty good. Um, you know, so um, yeah, I think you know, I I really liked it. I don't like, you know, I don't want to sound like sort of you know arrogant when we're like, like. We're, I don't think we're even necessarily criticizing the film, but it's just like just in discussion. But um, you know, I, I think this kind of stuff's cool. I love movies yeah. like this. Um, you know, for people who have never shot a film, um, like exterior, you know, a predominantly exterior film, and how difficult those conditions are, and how many you know weeks, and and uh, yeah. it's absolutely brutal, and um, so. I well, it's definitely Italy, and it, it, if you're not familiar with Italy's terrain, they have a lot of. It, it, it looks like the Grand Canyon. There's a lot of places in Italy that look like the Grand Canyon. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it, out there shooting that, what looks like is probably in the middle of summertime, 
like these aren't the, the best conditions to work in and uh, with like we were talking about how many people were actually on set like at times there could be close to hundreds of people uh, well not maybe I wouldn't say hundreds but close to 100 people out there at any given moment like when they have the people coming out of the tunnels and um, the choreography the fight choreography like it's it's um, is it like what we're probably accustomed to as a modern audience is no but I think especially for the time like it would have been um, a nice fun flick to watch with you know your friends like it, it's sort of in the same vein of like you know the deadly prey like the deadly prey like it might not be the greatest action film but there's enough there to like to keep you entertained to watch it um yes you'll be able to make some cracks at some of the things there's some you know funny stuff like there's the training montage that i thought was kind of hilarious <laughs> that, that you know the um sheriff is training james to be the new sheriff and it's like he's dodging um grain bags and like he's doing uh sit-ups with you know oh yes <laughs> It's it, you know kind of weird looking. It, this is big training montage to make James the new sheriff, and then he does this sh- shooting with the the gallery, and he shoots, I guess the wrong target, but it's hard to tell like why. I thought he hit them all. Yeah, it was yeah. pretty weird, and it was like ah, that's it. And then he has this daydream, and then I thought that was a dream, and he was. I like, thought it was too. It's it's a little confusing. And he's like leaves a note for him. Just <laughs> kidding, you're hired. You know, like I don't know. It was, it was interesting. Yeah, so I'll say the movie has a, definitely a lot of scenes. You can see where the, like how the movie was made in a, in a lot of areas. But I think it's going back to something that's very charming about it. Um, yeah, and it's funny. It's it, very rarely would you say that the action scene scenes in a film felt like filler, but in this particular film, some of the action scenes actually feel like filler uh, because. There's so much of people falling in the sand, and just yeah. you know, it just it goes on for a long time, which is very rare to say about like movies. I think in this vein, where it's like it's mostly action, like yeah. it is yeah. very much an action film. Um, it, not to say that it's a detriment to it, but it's definitely like it's an action film. There's a lot of it, there, and some of it's like it's, it can be a little repetitive, like that scene where the, all the uh, humanoids are massacred. Kind of feels like he goes on for like <laughs> for maybe long. five minutes too long than it should be. Yeah, yep, uh, yeah. But it's you know, like you said, that's that's a genre, and a lot of films were like that back then. You know, yeah, um, yeah. And I I was trying to look, find the budget. I couldn't find the budget on it, but I mean, it's, it's got to be at least a half a million. You know, um, yeah. I was thinking around the same thing. I was like, if it's less than two hundred thousand dollars, I'd be shocked because I mean, yeah. it definitely feels like it's like half a million dollars. Woody Strode probably got paid in ice well if he, they were using his footage I don't know how that works but yeah yeah I would I'm actually more curious about the editing process now that I know it's the editor of Troll 2 and I, I'm just trying to think about that you know the puzzle piece like what exactly did he get did he get two movies or did he get you know he got like 60 usable cut minutes worth of a film and they're like here's another film you can splice into it or what I, well, just I very fascinating Final Executioner is available on Amazon Prime so I, I, I want to watch that after I finish the oh. the unofficial Bronx trilogy so like I said there's the Bronx Warriors and then there's another movie um, I forgot what it, was, what it was called but there's another it's sort of in the same vein it looks like it was made by Italians again with uh, some of the same cast members and stuff so Mm. That'll be my my next uh, film, but I, I want to watch Final Execution too because I want to see how much carried over into the other project. That's not a first film. That's it's like a, or the, the, is it actually a trilogy? No, it's not a trilogy. I'm okay. calling my unofficial trilogy <laughs> okay, because understand. they have a very similar look. Mm-hmm. It's done by Italians, and they're all supposed to be set in New York City. And uh, as far as I can tell, none of them look like they're actually in New York City. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. It's like spaghetti, <laughs> apocalypse, post-apocalyptic. Well, that was my thought. I was like, I should research this and see if there was like this like explosion of Bronx, New York City movies <laughs> in Italy, like how the Westerns like in the you know, 60s and 70s. Wow, that's became. like a sub-sub-genre. Yeah. Italian, New York, post-apocalyptic. <laughs> Imagine a video store with that section. <laughs> I mean, it might be like four movies. <laughs> yeah. This might not be a very deep genre, but the fact that there's three of them there is more shocking than anything. They have Bronx in their title. 
which you know makes me wonder like I mean I know the Bronx even today is not like um, it's not a, a destination you know it's not you know when you're out vacationing you, you want to visit but how it was perceived back then and carried over and it's also like were they thinking of like the Warriors because well, with the Bronx Warriors it looks like they're playing a little bit off of the Warriors movie uh-huh. and it might be a continuation more of that because it looks like more gang um, activity mm-hmm but um, yeah, I can't wait to check that one out. That one looks really sweet. It has um, uh, the guy with the mustache, the big black guy. Oh, uh, um, Fred the Hammer Wilson. Yes, Fred, Fred the Hammer Wilson. <clears throat> he was in Dust Till Dawn as well. Yes, yeah, yeah, he's in it. So it's got to be good. Yeah, can't wait. So yeah, maybe we'll watch that one next. Um, well, I don't know. Any final thoughts? No, I mean, like guys, I said it's on Amazon Prime. Uh, check it out. Uh, it should be a good watch. I think, especially if you're watching it with some friends, some beer. Like if it's, if, and if you dig '80s VHS type stuff, and it is VHS quality. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So um, you know, if that is going to be a put off to you, then maybe skip it because it definitely looks like something you would see more like on YouTube. Yeah. But I would love for them to do like a cleanup of this print a little bit because like there are some things that are lost in the graininess that I think for sure. Would, wouldn't be improved. But you could tell some of the camera movements are really great. And, yeah, the aesthetic that they're showing here is just not... Uh, you can tell. I, I watched this remastered um, uh, movie called Street Trash. And uh, hopefully we can actually interview that filmmaker. And that's another subgenre uh, called melt films, right? <laughs> and that may only be about four. A, a subgenre that's four movies, you know, you know total but um that w- <laughs> the blu-ray was gorgeous and you're looking at this thing and you're and like why does this look so good you know they they rescan the negative and just it's it's beautiful and so you never know you never know how good that movie could look yeah, yeah. so well anyway uh thanks for listening uh i'm your host tom seymour and i'm your other host ken powell you're not gonna do your oh, check you later check you later it's been a while. <laughs>